All right, so yesterday we had you have a look at this register form and take it and kind of convert it into the DHIS2 data model. So actually, um, here before I proceed too far ahead, uh, I'm just gonna make this resource available to you so you can also view it. Okay, so if you go to the um, tracker um, terms and data model section, you'll see that I've posted this uh, Excel sheet here, integrated ANC delivery PNC registry, conceptual design, okay? And this is just going to be actually a uh, filled in sheet with all this information. Okay, and we're gonna use this to kind of review things today. All right, so you can have a, a look and download that and follow along um, as we're going through this. So we, we kind of asked you to have a look at this and decide how to you know, move it over to the DHIS2 data model and also to think about some of the indicators you could potentially form if you needed maybe separate data sources. And I know that uh, there wasn't enough time um, for the exercise. Um, I do apologize for that. But it was really kind of to get you in that mode of thinking how you would work through this. And I would say what I'm going to present, it's one way to do it. It doesn't mean it's the only way, right? The thing with tracker programs, right? It's completely dependent on the procedures that you're following, you know, on the routines that are there um, in your country. So me showing one particular way of setting things up, it doesn't mean it's the only way of doing it, right? There are often multiple ways to do things and not, none is right or wrong necessarily. There are some best practices we can generally follow, okay? But, um, you know, depending on the routines, the, the procedures and everything that you are kind of looking to implement, um, you know, things could be set up a little bit differently. And we'll talk about some of those differences um, as I go through that, all right? So the first thing we're gonna do, if we just review this sheet here, and I'll make it bigger so we can all see, okay? So the first thing I had you kind of do is look at the tracked entity attributes and identify the program stages, all right? So if I have a look at this, um, I also have some dates here as well, um, which I, I know this threw some of you off. I was kind of jumping between the rooms and just listening in um, on the conversation, okay? So we have a couple dates. So we have the enrollment date, which is the date of registration. Okay, and that's just taken from this first column in the form, okay? This is the date of registration here. And that's going to be the date that we use as our enrollment date. We have this, uh, sorry, I realize there's quite a few short forms on this form and I probably should have given you the definition of this. Uh, this LMP date is it's called the last menstrual period. This is what initiates a mother coming into the clinic for um, their ANC visits. So we're using this as the incident date. Now, I, I kind of mentioned in the directions uh, that sometimes you don't need the incident state. There, there are many programs where it's not necessarily something that is required, okay? But in this case, because we have something that initiates the sequence of events, we have an incident state, right? And then basically, these here are the attributes. This one, I knew this uh, might throw some people off, okay? And you know, you might have identified it as an attribute. Um, could be, theoretically, it wouldn't be wrong necessarily. But uh, you know, I've decided to put it in a, one of the program stages, right? Um, rather than have it something that's registered on the person, because um, you know, if they come in, or if you register them with those details, it's not really something. You know, it could change, right? They could have another pregnancy. The date of delivery will change. Okay. So uh, even though it's part of this registration information section, it's a bit of a dark horse, right? Um, you can kind of put it in a different component um, depending on what you're doing with your program. Okay. So that's what I've laid out here. It just has a handful of these attributes here. And for the village attribute, okay, I was going through and hearing some of the discussion around this, okay. Well, I've made village a uh, option set, okay. And, um, but I was hearing some of the discussion around this. Some of you had opted to make it an organization unit, okay. And it could be the case, theoretically. But if you're in a very large country, um, unless they have those um, villages as organization units set up, you know, this could be tens of thousands of villages, perhaps, okay, then you couldn't really set it up as an org unit, right? Because if you use org unit as the value type, then you will have to have those org units in your system, right? So you just kind of keep that in mind um, when you're setting these types of things up. Um, you could also have it as free text, maybe, as well. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get your hands on that village list. Um, this would perhaps reduce 
the amount of, of usefulness of this attribute. Because if you, you know, spell the village name wrong in a couple places, you can't really aggregate that data, but uh, you could still use it to just register the individual. Okay, so there's a couple ways you could handle this, um, kind of depending on, on what you need to do. All right. So the next thing I uh, kind of asked for is identification of the program stages. Okay, so if we have a look at this, there's basically three program stages that we can identify, and they're just split up basically into these headings. Right, so we have the routine ANC visits, and this is when the you know the mother comes back receives her ANC services prior to any of the delivery. Okay, we have the maternity and delivery here. Okay, and then we have the postnatal visit. Okay, now if we look at this sequence of events, okay, the routine ANC visits it occurs multiple times, right, and they're receiving the same set of services. So they can come, you know, for a first visit, a second visit, a third visit, a fourth visit. You know, now I think the recommendation is, you know, eight visits or more, right? So they can come multiple times to receive this antenatal care. So we could actually just repeat this information. And what we do by repeating this is, you know, we don't have to set up all the data elements and everything over again. It'll just be one program stage with several events, okay? If we remember from our data model that we discussed the other day, right? So this stage could be repeated, right? The other stages occur once in this sequence of events. Yes, a mother can deliver more than once, but you know they would um, be maybe enrolled in the program again um, during their second um, pregnancy, okay, or third pregnancy, right? During the sequence of events, they only deliver once, right? So this is a one-off event, so there's only uh, it's not repeated, and the same with the postnatal visit. This is a one-off event, um, and they they only come um, once for this postnatal care in this sequence, right? So in these cases, these two stages are not repeated, all right? So we generally go through this, you know, we're, we're going through this to kind of decide, you know, how we would actually build this in DHS2, right? And for any use case that we kind of are working with, we have to make these types of decisions or, or kind of have this discussion, right? To, to kind of figure out what it is we're going to do. Okay. So next thing was identification of the data elements. Now, I didn't expect you to actually write all these down, um, but I've uh, given you in the sheet that you can download from Moodle, just so you can see for reference, Okay, all the different data elements that are part of the different program stages. All right, and I've identified also the option sets um, that would belong to them. All right, so we can just go through a couple um, so you can, you know, just see for review. But I, I saw some of you actually just, you know, you were having no problem with this. I think it was more of a time issue, right? And it can take a bit of time to, to identify this. Um, so for each of these program stages, right, basically most of these columns are our um, data elements, right? And some of them, like this one, HIV test result has an option set, syphilis results has an option set, where you'd select from either positive, negative, or unknown. Some of these boxes, you have to be a bit careful because um, each of the programs, uh, each of the events within the program stages will have an event date. If you remember, we kind of covered this briefly when we were opening up the TV program and reviewing the events within the program stage, right? Um, it's something that was covered a bit quickly, but, so you might've missed it to be fair. Um, but, you know, for example, this date of visit, that could be the event date, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be a data element. In the maternity and delivery section, though, you have two dates, right? Date of delivery and date of discharge. So in all likelihood, the date of delivery would be your event date, and the date of discharge would be a separate data element, right? So when are they discharged from the hospital after the delivery, right? Um, if you look at all the events, it's dealing with the delivery itself, right? mode of delivery, the sex of the child, the status of the child at birth, if they're breastfed, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's all kind of dealing with the delivery and at the end, they're discharged, okay? So that would be an, a separate data element in this section. And we could use the date of delivery here um, as our event date, okay? Now, if we look at the postnatal visit, this one can uh, was a bit of a tricky one, I, I guess. So for the most part, this, this part is pretty straightforward. These are data elements. Some of them have option sets. And here's the event date, right? When the mother came for their postnatal care visit. If we look at the family planning options one, okay? Some of you might've identified this um, as having an option set. But if you look at the options, you have options for both male and female, right? There's male sterilization, male condoms, female condoms, and, and uh, several um, options for female sterilization, right? So, or, or other um, options for, for kind of family planning for females. So you could assign more than one of these, 
right, at that time, because you could assign something for the father, something for the mother, um, or you could, you know, have more than one, one method, right? Unfortunately, when you create an option set, you can't select, you know, multiple options, okay? Um, so in order to do this, you'd actually have to create all these as separate data elements, basically, under the current model within DHIS2. Um, and you can just create tick boxes, for example, but you'd have to create each of these options individually because you could assign more than one, right? So, so this one was a bit tricky. Um, you, you kind of had to think through, you know, how it works in DHIS2, um, but you wouldn't necessarily use an option set. So that's what I've identified here. Um, all these different types of family planning methods um, are, are identified as yes, only data elements essential, right? So what that means is they'll show up as a as a tick box in the data entry screen within DHIS2. Okay. Okay. Next thing is we can look at the sections, right? And this is not immediately present from the registry itself, but it's something we can use to group the data elements together. So once again, you would probably talk to somebody, you know, within the program, um, or if you have that expertise, to kind of, you know, make this uh, work a little bit um, based on what you're seeing. So these headings are split up on the kind of registry itself, the paper registry, okay? But when you're in DHS2, it's, you can also kind of further kind of section, section off these, these various items just to make it a bit easier and group things together um, for the person entering data, right? Um, so if we look at some of this, you know, some of these are closely related, like here, weight, height, and blood pressure, pressure for example. We're taking some, you know, vital markers of the mother to kind of understand um, you know, her current health situation, right? We have some lab results, uh, lab tests we're running on HIV and syphilis. And then we have uh, these here. Um, these are kind of prophylaxis methods for um, deworming, for malaria. LLIN is a long-lasting insecticidal net um, and, and iron, right? So they're kind of prophylaxis methods that we can kind of group together. This requires some knowledge, of course, of the delivery of the program um, itself. So it might not always be immediately apparent. Right, but we can, um, when working with others, try to identify, you know, how to section these off. So I've just kind of sectioned off some of them here, um, and this is, you know, for when you create the data entry form, you know, you could essentially section them off the same way. Okay, uh, and, and you can just have a look, like all the family planning methods are grouped together, um, all the the different uh, status of the child. So if we go to the next section here. Right, the sex, the status, the weight, the length. And once again, this is one way to present it. Um, this, the, there's no right or wrong way here. Um, absolutely, right? Um, I'm just show, sharing you know, what, something we typically come up with, but how it's actually structured, you know, that's, that could be very different depending on your, your needs and your requirements and, and how you use this information, right? So I'm just giving you an example here, but you could section it off differently and that would not be incorrect necessarily, okay? All right. Um, I also just uh, have a couple indicators here, um, and and I wanted to kind of talk about you know this because uh, it, it's quite important to try and identify these. There's just a couple here. If I look at that form, there's there's quite a few. You know, probably hundreds. Actually, we could extract from the program data we have um, based on what we're seeing. But I just wanted to extract a few um, just to discuss them. Right. So so we can have kind of very simple ones that just take the exact data from, from the registry um, and kind of create counts, you know, so we could get a count of stillbirths. We could get a count of the number of vacuum extraction, um, you know, delivery by vacuum extraction, the number of HIV positive test results, right? We could count each of these things for any of these parameters that we're seeing, right? Um, and that is one way to kind of define basic indicators about this is just to kind of create aggregations, create counts from our individual data, right? Okay. The other way we can look at this though is combining those with other parameters, whether it be population data or whether it be ratios or rates within the information that we're currently collecting. Um, so for example, ANC4 coverage or ANC4 plus coverage. So um, there's one option here, right? ANC visit, oh, sorry, that should be or plus, I guess. Um, okay. Um, and we could count the number of A and C um, fourth visits, right? But then we would have a denominator for that for coverage, right? 
And, you know, in this case, I put expected number of pregnancies, right? So this is not actually something we would collect in our tracker data, right? This is an external variable. We would have an estimate of the number of expected pregnancies within a certain period, whether it be, you know, maybe for a year, for example, we have that number that, you know, is calculated through surveys or other types of demographic type of tools um, that would be made available to us and we could use as our denominator, right? And the same thing here I've identified here in these uh, cesarean sections. So just to have a look at um, two different methods of, of looking at data, right? So one is taking the total number of live births that have been recorded, right? And you can take that from your tracker data, right? From here, right? By counting the number of cesarean sections where the baby is alive, Right, so you would combine information from these two columns, okay, and then you know you'd have a denominator where you're just um, taking the number of children that are alive, right, to get a proportion, right. And you could do the same thing though using the estimated live births, right. And this might be some other demographic information that you pull in from another system or another source, okay. So when you're thinking about or thinking through these things, you know, it's often useful to think well, not just uh, not just about okay. When I'm looking at the program directly, this is the information I have right in front of me, and these are the things I can do with it. But you can also think, you know, DHIS2 is, you know, quite allows you to pull in that information from other sources. It's quite a powerful tool to kind of create this, this kind of analyses across these, these different, uh, you know, variables. So you can also use, you know, different denominators depending on the program you need, for example, to create calculations. You can combine data across the program, right? So in, in this example, we're combining data from you know, the, the type of delivery, whether it's a C-section or not, and whether or not the, the child is alive, right? So you don't have to have single parameters um, all the time. And then you, know, you can use different denominators based on what's available um, to you at hand and, and what you are calculating and what you need to do, all right? So the whole idea about this was just to kind of think through that a little bit because it, it's quite important, right? And often when you write down your indicators, as, as Brian kind of mentioned in his presentation, right? The configuration needs to match, right? If you say, okay, I need this indicator calculated, but you're not collecting the information or you don't have the denominator available, then it's going to be different, difficult um, for you. Um, so you have to kind of make sure that's incorporated into your design um, when, when you're thinking through this a little bit more, right? So that's the whole idea between behind, uh, behind kind of identifying these a little bit more, right? Um, so lastly, we have the option sets and I've just laid them all out for you. I didn't expect you guys to get through um, all of this, but just so you can kind of see where they're taken from, um, for the most part, it's just, you know, these fields that have lists here, for example, the mode of delivery um, has normal vaginal delivery, vacuum extraction, cesarean section, the final diagnosis has all these different types of diagnoses that I could potentially select from. Some people asked about this yes and no um, type of variable, right? Do I create an option set for yes or no? Uh, and that kind of depends, okay? Um, I often do, actually, because I, it, it makes it easy for me to count the, the no's. Okay, um, which might be a bit of a strange concept the way I'm explaining it, but uh, there is a yes, no data type within DHIS2, okay? So you could use that and it would not be incorrect, okay? Um, there is, you could create an option set for this, okay? So uh, an option set being yes, no um, as well. It just kind of depends, you know, how you want to use that data, right? So for me, I find it quite easy to aggregate the option set, so that's why I often use it, but using a yes, no data type or a yes only data type um, is also correct theoretically, just depending on you know, how you wanna use that data. So we would go through this whole process before we do anything in DHIS2. And, and you know, this is generally true of any use case that we would kind of um, take part in, right? And this is just kind of documenting the kind of we haven't gone through and documented all the requirements necessarily, actually. What we're doing is, I mean, the indicators and the metadata is really what we've done um, in this exercise. As you go through um, more parts of the configuration, you know, we'll talk about some other requirements that you would be thinking about, um, you know, as you're kind of going through this as well, right? But, the, you know, it's a start, right? And we really have to kind of think about these things before we go into DHIS2. It saves us a lot of time. It makes everything clear. And also, you know, for anyone who's not necessarily a DHIS2 expert, but they might be a program expert of some kind, they might have a lot to contribute um, from the service delivery side. You know, it helps them to understand they're actually, you know, how things are going to be laid out, right? When you can review it with them in this way, you know, they're probably used to seeing stuff 
you know, you could develop a workflow or an Excel sheet or things like that, right? Things that are kind of people are familiar with, right? Um, and it helps to kind of do it this way rather than present something in an overtly technical manner. All right. So, so yeah, um, we've gone through this process at a kind of rapid pace. Um, often this, this might take a little bit longer in practice to do. Um, you know, there might be a bit more back and forth between the people kind of developing um, or implementing this inside of EHIS2 and, you know, the people that are kind of responsible for the service delivery aspect, the subject matter experts who kind of understand what indicators and data need to be calculated from this, et cetera, et cetera. But, and there could be a back, bit of back and forth, right? I will also say, um, sometimes it's not perfect when you start, right? So you define everything and you think, oh, this looks great. And you go to implement it all, people review it, and then, you know, there's changes that are required. And, and that's often the case, especially when it's kind of conceptual to begin with, right? People don't really, um, you know, they, that experienced DHIS2 person might have some idea of what the end product might look like. But, you know, for, for the most part, it's kind of hard to conceptualize for a lot of people until they see it on their screen and then they can make adjustments um, as necessary. So there is a bit of back and forth here um, as you deal with this design process, All right? Um, but yeah, just try to, you know, when you're thinking about it in the future, um, and you're kind of working on these types of programs, you know, go through this process of kind of making sure that you've identified, you know, to the extent you can, right? Don't let the perfection be the enemy of actually, you know, moving along. But, uh, um, you know, to the extent you can have uh, identified, you know, some of these requirements and, and, you know, you can refer to this then, you know, when you're building something inside of DHS2. All right. So if there are any questions about this topic, um, I know there's been some activity in the chat here, okay? Um, but you can also ask us on Slack, okay, about any of this, all right? So we're gonna kind of keep reinforcing this concept um, as we go through the various sessions. So it's not the last you've seen um, of this conceptual design, um, but we do wanna kind of use it now to actually design our program um, inside of DHIS2. So that's gonna be the focus um, of today. So if there are any questions about this, let us know, okay? And I'm gonna 